Julie Vincent. Julie is a self-made woman who has faced adversity head-on and come out victorious. She has held various roles in different industries such as small-town journalism, banking, mortgage lending, before falling into her real love of professional photography. Today she is the leading photographer in her market and an award-winning events photographer. Not only that, but she is also an exhibiting artist with 11 completed exhibitions, most recently in Tokyo and three more pending. We'll be doing a deep dive into her work her life, her struggles as a professional photographer, her exhibits, her work with First Nations, and more. If you like this type of content, please like, comment, and subscribe because every bit helps. When we reach the 10,000 new subscriber goal, I have some intense things planned. Until then, I'm working to put out two to three new episodes a week. Let's stay curious to learn about Julie, her passion, love, and emotional life and work on this episode of Learn Lowell Show. I think one of the things that was really interesting about you is that you went from like a state of like great, you know, I'd say upheaval where you're like 29, you're having a lot of stuff going on, and now you're in a state where I'd say it's probably pretty stable. Like you're probably in a much happier state than you were in yeah. like late twenties. So, um, if you could like kind of talk to us about like where you were then, and we'll kind of like catch up to where we are now. Well, if I can get you there really quickly, sort of what happened is after when I graduated high school, my dad gave me a camera and he said, "Go see the mm -hmm. world," and I took him up on that, obviously. And uh, the first place I went was London, and I went to school in England and you know, sort of while I was there, I had this camera and I was shooting, you know, just randomly. I didn't know how to use a camera or anything, but uh, I remember this day I was shooting off of one of the bridges downtown London and I looked over and there was a fella sleeping on a bench underneath. And I just shot this image. And like I say, I didn't really know anything about composition or anything like that, but when the image, it was film. And when I kind of got it produced, I looked at it and I'm like, oh, this is totally what I want to do. It was, and I still can picture that really well. I wish I had it to show you. It was a really cool image. There's this huge oak tree, you know, sort of framing the guy. And he was way, way, way below the bridge. And it was kind of, you know, one of those epic. Anyway, that's when I knew I kind of wanted to pursue it. But at the time, I didn't know how I was going to pursue it because I was doing hair. I had a young child. That's mm -hmm. what I went to school for in England to take hairdressing. And anyway, time went on, time went on. I got married. I had two more kids. And that... Uh, <laughs> That was um, <laughs> complex, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of when that kind of ended, I was, you know, look, I had to work and I just went into banking and, you know, I didn't hate that. And then I went back to school and uh, did a degree in journalism. And then I did a post degree. It's a it's post degree certificate in uh, professional writing and professional uh, and journalism. Also, I did two of them. So along I go, I'm, you know, kind of writing for a small newspaper and being a photojournalist. And I love that. But then the media, as you know, um, newspapers kind of started to like that. And yeah. the paper that I was writing for is about um, 45 minutes away from here. So, uh, you know, it was costing me money to get out there every day. And they kind of changed their payment format and said, oh, we're just going to pay you $10 for photos and 10 bucks for an article. And it just wasn't even going to pay for my gas. So hmm. I had to leave that, which kind of sucked, but cause it was fun. I loved writing for a small paper, but anyway, in and amongst around all this stuff, I happened to be on our um, MLS system, which most people know the multiple listing service. And I saw this photograph on there where a realtor had shot down the length of a basement. You can imagine this bowling alley basement with Brown, paneling on it and there was a treadmill in the middle of the basement and there was underwear hanging off this treadmill and the realtor shot down the middle of this thing like literally right through the middle of the treadmill and that's when I went oh I can I can do this I can do this better than that and I started calling people that I know and said hey you know I'm doing this for a living now I'd really love to shoot for you and here we are 15 15 years later I'm uh shooting real estate primarily some architecture i do a lot of events uh and i'll tell you more about that when you ask so that's how i got to here yeah uh it, it sounds very interesting the just like the serendipity of taking a picture and that kind of stays in with you for the whole time yeah was, were you was it something that even with all the different like trend banking trying these different things out were you still taking photos in your free time or was it something oh, yeah. you ever had to shelve okay yeah no yeah. i always did and it's it's really interesting i i always you know had that camera with me and i shot a lot of stuff and you know i've got a lot of stuff that i show, shot on film and then sort of in and around a bunch of stuff that was going on you know my kids were all in middle school at that point and i i remember i photographed my middle daughter's ninth grade graduation 
And then I realized that I didn't have those photos anywhere. And it took me like two years to realize that I had lost my film camera, which I was devastated. I loved that camera. I think I left it at the hotel they had the thing at. And anyway, things were really busy at that time. And I, I, I was probably at that point going through a divorce. So, you mm-hmm. know, some of that stuff slipped. Anyways, later on, I uh, did finally discover I'd lost that camera. And my now husband, he, he had a little digital. It was hilarious. It was one of those Sonys like this big. And it was like a three megapixel camera. And he paid, I don't know, seven or $800 for it. And anyway, so he gave me that and I kind of picked it up again. And, and then, I, you know, I just started to follow people around. And then one day I'm like, okay, I'm really going to do this. I have to stop messing around after, you know, 30 years at that point. And I bought myself a Canon 40D and a couple of lenses and it just started from there. It, that's how I went. Mm-hmm. The, so, um, is there like a good intro camera for that you'd recommend to people? Like what, how hmm. do you, like, cause there's, there's always so like the latest technology, but I doubt people need like one of those, like, then they're like the dragon things or the red cameras. They're like, 40 oh, grand yeah. they're like this big i hear people you know going all about them but like if you're, if you're just starting you're trying to experiment with this type of uh, profession like what, do, what would you recommend like someone who's just gonna be a hobbyist and test it and like someone yeah. who's maybe just starting out i mean i would i would have called myself a hobbyist mostly when i got my mm. 40d so i would say get a, a camera that is you can use you know something that you can learn all the functions on you know something that has manual auto, uh, manual aperture shutter you know something that's like a, a consumer professional camera or, um, what do they call those now um but, dslrs yeah like a dslr or something in that range i think you know mm. people, we're all moving now to uh, mirrorless which isn't my jam necessarily but get something that you can grow into as opposed to something you will grow out of very quickly. You know, it's better to have, well, in my case, you know, getting the 40D was a big step up from the, the little Sony uh, DS, whatever it was, you know, cause all it was, was essentially a point and shoot. And that was all I could do with it. So, you know, get something that you can grow into and then give yourself the time to learn those functions. And so when I, I teach photography and what I say to my students is, you know, get your manual out, like don't throw that out. That's a really poor, important piece of your kit. Get that manual out and go look for the things that you're gonna use all the time. ISO, aperture, shutter, manual, find how those things all work together and spend a day just using one of those things. So like one day you're Mm going to say, okay, I'm going to go out, I'm going to shoot on aperture priority today. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to come home and see, you know, throw this stuff into the computer and see what that looks like. You know, if I'm shooting really wide, I'm shooting really small. Next day, I'm going to go out and shoot on shutter priority. And I'm just going to go through the whole range of shutter speeds uh, and kind of learn that way. But, and I, I would say, I'm not a gearhead. I've, feel like get get the best thing that you can afford at the time and you'll have heard this for many people but a good camera is always going to be better with great glass on it so you know if you can afford a good dslr and with a with a good lens on it down the road you can always you know if you're staying in the same range of cameras you, you can always upgrade your lenses. And even if you go to a mirrorless system at some point, the, um, the adapters are so inexpensive that you can just stay with your lenses. So good glass is where I spend my money personally. Mm-hmm. I That's do love my lens. 72 though. Boy, I love that camera. I'm, I'm so spoiled with that 72 and they're like the new mirrorless version is the set R, uh, R7, I think. And it has a digital viewfinder, which I really, really dislike. So I'm sticking with my, sticking with my dslrs at the moment what's the so a mirrorless like there's like the mirror inside the the camera that like flips the image yeah Is that the difference yeah. between mirrorless and not exactly and that's that's pretty much the only moving part in a camera mm-hmm. is that you know the shutter and the mirror so the mirrorless cameras essentially they work like a normal dslr they just don't have the mechanical piece so i suppose that their life will be longer because there isn't something to break down oh that's us saying hello it's time for your meeting <laughs> uh and I, I i don't i can't really talk about uh, mirrorless cameras i'm honestly at this point i'm not a fan yet it's it's new enough technology that i personally am not going there yet um i don't need to the type of work i do is easily done with my dslr i'm old school gosh i know you know lots of old old photographers that are still in the dslr range but 
Yeah. And then um, when you're doing real estate, I, I, I've definitely, when I've looked at houses and stuff and see what people take pictures of, Ugh. it's pretty terrible. It's pretty terrible. Like, even like the ones where it's like, oh, this is a very expensive place. It looks like they're like Cousin Vinny <laughs> like when they're with oh. like, like a 20-year-old camera. It's like, wow. You know, and again, it's not the camera so much as it is mm. the ability to see that space. And I, I think there are two parts of that that really um, have to be attended to. So the primary one is finding a realtor who is committed to their clients and committed to doing a good job across the board. So that means all of their marketing. And that means all of their clients are equally valuable. So I always say to people, you know, I get a lot of realtors saying to me, well, I don't want to spend, you know, this money on a small little condo for, you know, a 20 year old. And I'm like, I always say to them, well, who helped them buy that condo? Who gave them the down payment? Because I bet you it's mom and dad. And I bet you mom and dad are in a four or $500,000 listing. So do you want their business too? It makes it worth what makes it worthwhile to mm. do a great job for that small client, just as it does for the bigger client. And that the reverse is true as well. If you've got mom and dad in a million dollar home, they likely have kids who they, you know, we live in this era now where not all of us can dig up our own down payment. So, uh, so the first part is a realtor who knows that marketing matters across the board, no matter who they're working for. And a photographer who also has that commitment and thinks about their work in two ways. One, they have to impress their self. I am really, really inclined to do good work that makes me happy. And also to um, do work that makes that realtor look good. And I, I would say not to necessarily just impress the realtor, but also to put stuff in place for them, images in place for them that when other clients who they may not have got yet are looking at the work on their MLS listings, that they're consistently seeing beautiful work. So that's the first part of it. And then the second part of it for the real, for the um, photographer is to learn how to shoot those spaces properly. Um, one, one thing that I see a lot that really bothers me is stuff in the image. So kind of stuff, like if you're looking at my hand in the edge of this image, something yep. that's just sticking in there and that immediately takes your eye away from the hole and right over to what is that? Sticking yeah, you're right. In. So yeah, that, my eyes are irritated by it. Exactly. Yeah. It really, we cause it pulls focus, you know, as we say. And then the other thing is to learn how to compose a room. Um, so, so that stuff, you know, it's not sticking in. It doesn't look crowded. Like your goal is to make that room look spacious and welcoming and kind of as much as we can take, take out the, person who's living there, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And I, I know I've achieved that when I hear, I usually hear back from the realtors, but the client will call the realtor and say, oh my God, my house looks beautiful. I would buy that place. Well, I've done my job because now I know the realtor looks like a genius. The client's happy, but you know, you'll know, you know, if you go through the real estate listings on any MLS listing, holy Dinah, like yeah. don't, don't shoot it with your iPhone. Well, it's good business for you at the very least. The, yeah. How do you, is it universal? Like when it's, um, when you're in Tokyo or anywhere around the world, do these principles hold up or do like cultures have a different, uh, priority in terms of how they like will appreciate an image if that makes sense. So, like if you're in Japan and Tokyo and you're doing like shots, do they, do they look for things that are different than like someone in Canada would look for things? Yeah. Well, I'll say that I'll, I'll give you two answers here. So I have never shot real estate in oh, okay. Japan, but I have shot in Japan. So it's a really, my, the show that we have up right now, but, well, the, sorry, not the show we have right now. The show we have right now just came down in Tokyo, but the work that we shot in Tokyo, it's an interesting place to shoot because, you know, we're, it's invasive to do street photography. So we have to be very careful across the board that we're not invading scenes and, you know, disturbing people. And Japan's really different in the sense that I stick out, like I stick out, like I can stand on a street corner and do absolutely nothing. And I'm still, you know, this is so uncommon in Japan. People that have their hair go this color in Japan will color it. There's no such thing as a person. Mm. So, um, but as far as real estate there, yes, the, the aesthetic is really different there. Um, it's interesting. It's either very, very cluttered or it's very minimalist. And there doesn't, in my understanding of it, there doesn't seem to be a middle ground really. Um, 
especially in Tokyo, most of the homes are quite small. So, so just to give you a relative, I live in a house and my house is about a thousand square feet on the main floor. And I had a uh, exchange student come and stay with me for a month. And she walked in the door and she first of all, wouldn't come in. For, I'll tell you why in a second, but she kept saying, Oh, your house is so enormous. Your house is so enormous. And I, you know, obviously I live where I live and my house is not enormous relative to what's around me. The other problem with my house is that it's an open plan. So when you walk in my front door, you're basically staring at my kitchen. And in Japan, you will never walk into somebody's kitchen without being invited. So she didn't know what to do. She was standing at my front door going, oh, no. Anyway, she got used to it. But but yeah, I, th I think things do. Um, I think there is a cultural, you know, Mm, flavor to photography for sure and where it relates to real estate photography you and I both know this like in my city there this is quite a um I would say it's a wealthy city and so there's a shift or there has been a shift in, in this city to really good photography just north of us is another city about 300 kilometers north of us uh where the economic demographic is a little different. And so the photography is also quite different. The fees that people can charge are lower and the quality of the work is quite different from Calgary. Uh, if, if you go, you know, sort of east of us, there's another small, large town, small city called Strathmore, and that's a country place. So, you know, the, you know, the quality of the photography isn't something that I would be doing. It's, you know, uh, anyway, I get real frustrated when I'm looking at stuff online. I've been looking with my daughter. Um, my daughter's moving to Syracuse, New York in a couple of months, and we've been looking for places for her and her husband. And I'm just like, what are these realtors doing? Like they're writing, you know, motivated, motivated seller, but the place mm. is a mess and there's literally garbage in the shot and there are towels on door. I just like, I don't know. It, it's not my yeah. jam. <laughs> Yeah, the some of the listings I've seen, there was one where um they were selling like this something from like the eighteen fifties or something. Like it's really mm -hmm. old. It looks it. And they're like, if you we, we're gonna sell it to you, but we approve how you update it and we demand to maintain the ability to walk in our dogs in your yard and you have to pick up after them. It's like, why would I do this? Like wow. how is it inviting? Yeah. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff like that. There was another one where um, a person was like X amount and it has to be in cash and you have to be happy with whatever it is. And you can just see it's like pack rats used to live there. Wow. It's, like, it's kind of interesting. And then like the, the text is like, you know, all caps, like great investment opportunity. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, I don't know. Um, maybe America's is, a little like, eccentric. Is that even legal? Like, I suppose it depends state to state what or even county to county, I suppose. But is that legal to say I get to come into your house any old time I like? Like, how would they ever make that? Um, I mean, if you agree to it, I think America's really weird. Like uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people, I don't want to say this while like getting canceled, but basically some, <laughs> there's like these things called HOAs and there's, yeah. which I, I think go like against what a lot of the people who live in HOAs believe, which is like, Hey, leave me be, I'm going to do my own thing. But then there's times where, but from what I can tell, it's legal if you sign it, <laughs> like, but like, wow. yeah. So, um, America's weird. There's, I've been, I'm talking to a lot of people where it's like in other parts of the, the world, they regulate first and then, um, then you can do something. But in America, it's almost like go do it and then ask for, per, ask for forgiveness sort yeah. of. So, um, there's like, there's like, you can't discriminate, Like there's like that type of stuff. But in terms of like, I, I don't know to the extent, like, it, unless it's like heinous, I think there's some protection. If we made it a deal and it was like completely like taking advantage of you, like ridiculous, I think you could void it. But, um. But I think generally, if you're like a of sound mind and you sign sign something like I, I, like America's weird, like they'll like seal your kidneys, I guess. Wow, that's crazy. We so I don't know very much about the American or the mm. U.S. Sorry, I, sorry, I'm going to differentiate because up here in Canada, when we talk about America, we're talking about North and South America, uh, and and I know you people in the U.S. often refer to um, the U.S. as America. But anyways, uh, yeah. we in in our province, so the ten provinces and the three territories that are part of Canada. Each of those has its own uh, real estate legislation, um, and they don't mm -hmm. differ very much province to province. I'll say that, but that you're right when you say uh, legislation first. Um, so there are very uh, written expectations, very carved in stone, as we say, uh, in terms of how you can sell a house, when you can sell a house, what you can require, you know, from 
what you can require from a buyer, but the, there's more emphasis on what a seller has to do. So yeah. for instance, if, if I'm going to go buy a house here in Calgary, in my contract, I can specify to the seller, if I don't get the interest rate that I want, I will not buy your house. If you mm. don't do these upgrades, I will not buy your house, or you can give me, you know, X number of dollars to remediate what that kind of things is. I mean, when we, we had a really hot, hot market here in about 2007, I guess it was madness that year. And people were writing these contracts with all of these stipulations in their mm. conditions, they're called. And a lot of people were adding in and a certain model of lawnmower to see <laughs> to see how serious the buyers were, the sellers were anyways, you know, but yeah, the legislation yeah. first and like that would never, there's no way that that would fly up here. You wouldn't be able to say, oh, it's a heritage property. I want the right to come and go as I want. It's, we have, you, you have this too in the United States, but that concept of freehold means I freely hold this property. Uh, but that's interesting because my, my eldest daughter's dad lives in England and he has a really big property that's on about 20, I don't know, 30, maybe 32 acres. And it's what's called a listed property there. So it's a heritage mm. property. And that property, because it's a heritage property, he is under some constraints as to what he can do in terms of renovating it. So um, the, the envelope, so the exterior of the place, it's a quadrangle and a stable. He, he can update it and he can repair it, but it must not look different than it did when it was built in 1802 or whatever it was. Uh, on the inside, he can do a certain amount of sort of modernization, but even that he's quite restricted. So, uh, and we, we do have that to a point here in Calgary. We, we're not a very old city, but some of the buildings here date from, I don't know, I think the oldest would be sort of mid 1850s ish. Uh, so there are some heritage expectations with those buildings, but there's no way that a former owner could just say, by the way, I'm coming in to walk my dog and can I use your loo? That wouldn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's um there's some stuff like that where um like you can add stuff where it's like if if you don't get um if it doesn't pass a certain inspection or whatever then it's going to decrease or you're going to have to pay the difference or repair right. it. Um, well, unfortunately, this last year, like like a year ago at this time, everyone was just like paying for stuff on the sight unseen. And I was talking to a bunch of real estate people, and there's a lot of bankers like the the banks were just buying up single family homes. Oh, okay. And so they didn't care how much it cost. So there's a there's a lot of situations where people had stipulations where it's like buy like buying it sight unseen, you can't have an inspector. Mm -hmm. So I would never I would never put myself like you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in the hole without like having like lots of uh, guarantees that that's a, a solid thing. Yeah. A, a lot of people are very much regretting it now as I'm like sure. the economic especially the economy is like uh, switching a little bit. It used yeah. to be like a, a seller's market. Now it's kind of more of a buyer's market and stuff yeah. like that. But America's a weird place, especially with land. And it's kind of weird to see yeah. so many banks buy them all up. It's kind of sad. Yeah. Well, that I'm like, where do people game, go? That's the second time that that is happening. Cause when the, you know, sort of the great recession that happened, whatever, uh, however many years ago, the hedge fund guys were doing that and, you know, buying mortgages and all this kind of stuff. And that put a lot of people out of their homes there. It, it is really different in Canada in terms of the laws uh, related to buying. But what you were talking about sight unseen, we, we have that. And I know they have that in mm. the United States as well, where um, it's called a, floor, a foreclosure. So the bank basically takes it over and yep. you will know as much as the bank knows about it, but they aren't able to go into that home and photograph it because the owner still owns it until such time as mm. the bank can get them out of there. So those ones, yeah, we have that, you know, and, and it's sold at, um, as is, where is, is how it's termed. Yeah. Uh, you know, that can be a good purchase, but where, for me, you know, as a photographer, that's really hard because all I get to do, if I get to do that at all, is go and take the exteriors of the home. And the person buying that home has no clue what the state of that interior could be. And you will not be surprised to know that foreclosures can often be absolutely destroyed because, yeah. you know, an owner who's being removed from that property sometimes isn't that happy about that. <laughs> so they kind of, you know, we call it getting your Gordy house out. And I don't know if you know what that means, but, you know, get Gordy Howe's out and put holes in the walls. Gord, Gordy mm. Howe was a Canadian hockey player. He used to skate with his okay. yeah, elbows I was out like, like that. that so, yeah. yeah, I've never heard of that phrase. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, yeah. America's weird. There's a, there's like, we have like also, um, like if you just like go into a house and sit there long enough, you'll have residency. Oh there's yeah. There's been times where, uh, military people who are serving overseas come back and there's people living in their house. Oh yeah. And they pay, like, five, yeah. They have yeah. to pay like a ton of money to oh. get them out. That seems, yeah. 
I think that's why a lot of people are kind of going towards like Airbnb or like short-term rentals so that people don't develop um, resident rights so that yeah. you can more easily move around and make money. But yeah. then you have the problem with like, I don't know if you've seen that up in Canada, but there are people down here where it's like, it's like $50 a night. But then when you go to like confirm, they'll add like a thousand dollars worth of fees and stuff on there. Wow. Like the people are, yeah, some people are like really greedy, I guess. But um, at the same time, I guess someone has to say yes to it. So yeah. someone's not being smart with their money or yeah, they would Airbnb, stop doing it. Yeah. That's a whole other, you know, uh, situation up here. So with, we have Airbnb and, and VRBO as well. So, um, and I do know that I, for myself, I've seen that where I've kind of kind of looked at a place and you think it's whatever, cause they listed at 78 bucks a night or whatever it is. But then when you go to buy that or book that, then the cleaning fee and then the whatever wow. all fees get added on. So yeah, it's, and frankly, those places are, not less expensive than a hotel in my mind. Uh, yeah. I'm back to uh, liking hotels more. Yeah. But we, but that's a market that I would love to do more of actually is the pho- mm. photographing Airbnbs because a lot of people, same thing, you know, you've got these beautiful places. They've spent money. A lot of these people will spend a lot of money staging these places and buying furniture and, you know, having them look really pristine and then they'll shoot it with their iPhone. So it looks you know, it doesn't look like what it looks like. And that is really yeah. unfortunate because now you've got crappy photos and then you have that fee and that person who's potentially wanting to book that place is like, well, I don't want to pay this much money for that dump when it possibly isn't even a dump. So, yeah. Anyway. Also, it's like the false advertising of it. Like uh-huh. you have one set of images you walk through. If I walk through and it's like entirely different, I'm going away. Like there have been yeah. hotels that are like that where you walk yeah. in and it's like someone's gonna steal my kidney in the night. But there's like <laughs> the credit card companies are a little bit like, okay, take a picture and we'll, we'll make sure they don't charge you. Yeah. Um, but how do you um, how do you suss out? So there's as we're talking about, there's people who just like will kind of game a system, you know, whether or not they're like staying at home or not. But I'm sure that with business, there's <laughs> equally amount of people that are just jerks who will try to take you for a ride. How do you suss out when you partner with people to do these photo? Uh, phot- uh, take these photos. Yeah. How do you know who's like, um, uh, who's not going to waste a, a huge amount of your time and going to be worth the investment of your time to, to work well, with them? I do t- a couple of things. So if it's somebody that mm. has been referred to me from a brokerage that I work with regularly, I, yeah. I generally will know, you know, there's, there's, um, peer pressure for them to behave properly. Uh, so getting a client that way is, is a pretty sure deal. But when I, when I get somebody who comes to me and I don't know them and I don't know their brokerage, I write, I have contracts for all my clients and they're, it's sort of a, it's kind of a one-off. So the first time they come to work with me, it says, this is what I'm going to do for you. These are what my fees are. You can anticipate this much time for these kinds of residences. Uh, you, and then those kinds of people, I will ask for at least a de- deposit up front and usually payment because, but um, and you know, the people I work with all the time, like there, I, I have a roster of, I don't know, at this point, about 20 realtors that I work with really regularly. And they're really good. I mean, I, even one guy called me up, he, he hadn't been seeing my emails, my invoices. And he called me and he was just in a panic. And he's like, Oh, I can't lose this relationship. And I really love working with you. And I'm like, babe, don't worry. I didn't say babe, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> he, we're, we're actually quite good friends. I could probably say that to him without too much complication, but all the same, keep it professional. But I said to him, yeah. look, look, don't worry. You know, I've been working with this guy for, I don't know, eight or nine years and he's really lovely. And I said, don't worry. I know they're going into your junk. Don't worry. We'll see. I know where you live. I literally know where he lives. His <laughs> wife and I are friends. It's okay. But then there mm-hmm. was another fella who I worked with and he actually threatened me physically. And wow. the, um, so I did say to him, I, I won't work for you and I won't take your calls and I won't take your emails. And he works for a couple of fellas who renovate properties. And I said to them, I will work for you as long as you're not with that realtor, but I'm not coming in any of your properties if he's there. So, you know, sometimes you have to cut your losses. Um, yeah. yeah. And then right now I'm actually dealing, I'm going to be unfortunately suing a client who, mm. Uh, I did some work for him. <clears throat> he has a building in Calgary that he's renovating from an office building into a short state re- residence. So it's four stories and he's mm-hmm. kind of res- uh, renovating floor by floor. So he asked me to come in and do some photos of the main and the uh, second floor and some of the suites and open areas and all that kind of stuff. And I always ask, what are you going to do with these images? Oh, we're just going to put them on our Facebook. You know, we're just going to advertise locally. And I'm like, okay. So I went in, none of those suites were staged. So, you know, it wasn't a lot of work, but I still had to stage them up because I want them to look good because that's going on my yeah. page as well. Uh, I staged his main areas and got it all done, got him the photos the next day. I think I did 55 photos for him. And 
he he called me a couple of weeks later and asked me for some other help. He wanted art. So I solicited in the group that I'm a moderator for, for art. And then he ghosted me and he ghosted me and ghosted me. And he, you know, wouldn't respond to any of my e- emails. My invoices come through a system that I can see when the client opens yeah. it, like literally day and time. And I could see that he was opening these. And so finally by November, he hasn't paid me. And this is from July. Uh, so I sent him another invoice updated to say, I haven't been paid. You no longer have the right to use those photos. You don't have license. If you have them up anywhere, you have to take them down. Doing anything other would be a copyright infringement. He ignores this. Mm. So then I, you know, sent out, my system is automated. So it kind of sends out these reminders. And in December, I kind of got a little pissy, I would say. And I finally said, look, if you don't pay me, I'm going to lodge a small claims Uh, file against you. And he still didn't, which is amazing to me. So I finally wrote him another invoice to say, okay, I'm filing on this day at this time, you owe me this much money, I'm going to be filing for costs and you know, and the next day, surprise, surprise, he pays the original invoice. But in between the time that I threatened him with legal action and the payment, I went online just to see if he was using these images anywhere. Oh yes, he's using them. He's using them on Expedia, Travelocity, Hotels.com. Mm. Like he's using all on these really big sites that have huge mm. reach. And he calls me and he's like, well, you know, I don't know what to do. It's like, I've been away and I've been busy. And I'm like, I got a little upset with him, but you know. <laughs> hey, you know, like, he's lying to you. Yeah, he was lying to me. And he's like, well, you know, I was, I'm busy. I was like planning my son's bar mitzvah. And I'm like, well, first of all, I know you're not doing that because your son lives abroad with his mom. So mama's planning the bar mitzvah. And I know he's where they live now. Like he went to visit, but I'm like, you couldn't pick up a phone. And he's like, well, I was busy. I'm like, you couldn't pick up a phone for six months, but you're planning a bar mitzvah. You've got to be calling people to do that. (laughs) Anyway, long story short, he's like, well, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, had you paid me? I never would have checked this out, but now I know you haven't paid me and now you're using my work all over the place. So, Hey, it's I'm actually my next call is to a copyright copyright lawyer. So, but I couldn't really have anticipated that because our yeah. conversation was such that he, he was evasive and, you know, dishonest and didn't tell me what he was planning on doing with those images. And so file under, you know, live and learn. But I think even if I'd had a contract with him, he probably would have been in breach anyway. Uh, yeah. But I will say in 15 years, I've had that issue and that fellow who I won't work for anymore. And that's literally it. I've, I've had wonderful clients and really enjoyed meeting a lot of the homeowners. And and by extension, you know, you know, selling a home is quite a thing. It's a really emotional thing. So I, I try to, well, I do, I go into a home and try and create a rapport with the homeowner right away because I'm in there messing with their stuff. Like a lot of times I'm actually moving furniture out of rooms and, you know, kind of sometimes I make their beds. And <laughs> so I'm just careful with them. And I, you know, can I, do you mind if I move this and can I neat this up and do you mind whatever, whatever, um, in, in all these 15 years, I did have one client just absolutely don't touch my stuff don't go in those rooms. Unfortunately, she was a renter and the homeowner had only just told her half an hour before I got there that she was putting the house on the market. So this poor lady wasn't informed and that was pretty rough and and she was a hoarder. So that wasn't fun, (laughs) but it was, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I just, I really enjoy this work. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, I've had people, younger people suggest to me that I'm a sellout because I'm not a real photographer because this is what I do for money, but I love this work and doing this for money pays my bills, obviously, but it also allows me to do the other work that is art and, you know, allowed me to travel for five years and do our, our big show called tripping the streets. Fantastic. It's allowed me to, you know, follow around this other project that we've been doing since 2018 um, so we, our exhibition now is called Indian Relay and Indian Relay is a really big deal out here in, in what, what is the Blackfoot Confederacy. So that's like Southern Alberta and down into Browning, Montana, and a little bit into Saskatchewan, which is the province just to the east of us. Um, and it, Relay is 
a very old sport, but in Canada, it hasn't been organized for very many years. So when we kind of connected with these people in the teams, we decided that our commitment was going to be following the relay around and providing pro photos to the teams. Often they don't have a ton of money. So, um, but yeah, you know, this, my work in real estate and events and whatever all else I do allows me to follow the relay around and spend the weekend there photographing it and, you know, giving these people photography. And it's allowed us also to put up this uh, exhibition that just came down in Japan and is going up in actually it's going up in Washington, DC this week. So Washington, DC, man. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting. It's, I mean, it is very cool. And it's, it's interesting to hear these young people, you know, judge you versus listen and think, you know, Hey, this woman is doing something really cool. I could copy this and have a, less stressful life because you know if they're just you know there's this thing about starving artists and you're like you're not a starving artist so like that's something to be emulated and be yeah brought up but at the same time like that puts a pressure on you and and, um it's good that it seems like from what i'm hearing like you have a lot of mental strength because i think if you were there's people that will just like kind of ever like give people a little bit of the mile like that guy who you know you showed up and like nothing was ready and you start doing stuff like there are people that like they'll see that and they'll think oh i can take more from this woman i can take more from this woman i can take more from this woman oh he did and uh (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, like, but in fifteen years, like, you you've been strong, like, not, you know, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time. So no one yeah. does that. Sometimes I feel that um, when you respect yourself, it forces other people to respect you. Yeah. But then there are people I've, I've talked with that um, they'll be a little bit more giving, and then you'll meet people that are like, oh, okay, well, I can make money off of you, yeah. or I can take advantage of you and stuff. It's like, how much money are you really gonna make? Like, you know, yeah. like at a certain point, people are gonna know you do this. Yeah. Every person I've known who like screws people over and stuff like that people very quickly find out who they are and they're yeah. little pariahs. Like you have like, it's like a, a sh- like a shark with all those little bottom feeders. Like, those are the only people that could ever talk to that person. Yeah. And they're all going to boost them up. Like, oh, you're not doing anything wrong. You're not doing anything wrong. I keep paying my, my checks and stuff no. like that. So. Yeah, it's frustrating. And I agree with you. I think integrity is a big deal for anybody, but you know, us um, in real estate and in events, and, you know, I do family stuff and all that, that kind of stuff, you know, the, our, our integrity as photographers is really important. Like it, it touches so many people. So, so just in terms of my niche, which is to say other photographers generally, but generally I have to be respectful of other people who work in my field and specifically in my city. This is a really weird thing about Calgary. It's we're known in this city for being this, the biggest small town in Canada. Mm. So we're about uh, 1.3 million people in this city and it is bizarre how well people know each other and how interconnected people are here. Like it happens. And it, it's really interesting because people who, who move here will often say it is so weird how you guys know each other in a city this big. So I know that I am at least I'm at most two degrees of separation away from anybody who works in the photography niche in my city. So my integrity has to be such that the way I work, how I work, how I treat my customers, how I interact with my clients, clients, that has to be, um, it has to be full of integrity because the work gets around period. And I think too, one of the things that I'm sorry, I'm just going to complain for a minute. That's one, all of good. The, one of the things that really, really bugs me is when photographers, new photographers, particularly come into the field and they cut their prices down to nothing. So I do know that some people, um, especially during the first part of the pandemic, you know, they were cutting down their fees and they were going in and shooting house for $80. Mm. Well, let's say $89. I think that was sort of the going rate. Well, I'm sorry, but you're not making any money doing that. You would have to shoot six houses a day, every day of the week to make a base annual of about $24,000 and nobody can live on that and nobody can live like that. So that's dumb. (laughs) Um, In order to make about a $50,000 annual income, not including your driving and all of the other stuff that goes into the work that we do, because we're driving all over the city, you would have to shoot 12 houses a day, every day of the week for 50, most of the weeks of the year. And nobody can live that life. You don't have time to edit. You don't have to quality control. You don't have time to interact with your realtor or your client or whatever it is. That's dumb. So, and I think it's disrespectful to other people in this marketplace. I would suggest to people, instead of cutting your prices or coming in at a very low rate like that, 
spend a minute with somebody else or go and volunteer your services to somebody, an organization for a year, cut your teeth, learn your camera, do a good job, get a portfolio, and then come in at market rates. You know, like, I I think there's that balance there where it's respectful to other people in our industry that we're not undercutting each other and also, you know, exiting them, exiting the field by virtue of just not being able to feed ourselves. That's, Mm -hmm. that's not good. So I get this all the time from people that come to my classes, you know, I'm just, I'm going to start doing portraits for $50 for an hour. And I'm like, well, first of all, you're not working for an hour. You're going to set up your studio. That's going to take you half an hour unless it's sitting there all the time. And if it is sitting there all the time, well, now you've got a room in your house that you can't rent out. You're costing yourself something. You're going to spend 10 or 15 minutes getting your client comfortable. You're going to spend an hour shooting them. You're going to take down your studio. Then you're going to go sit in your office or wherever you do your photos, load them up, do all that culling, do all that editing. So no, you're not doing that an hour. You're probably closer to three or four hours. And if you're driving to that person's place, well, now you can add on another, in our city, you can drive north to south in about, I don't know, it takes us about 80 minutes to drive from the bottom to uh, deep south to deep north. So that's the other thing. I think people don't understand what costs they have and what time they're actually putting into something. So, and I honestly, I would love it if people would call me up and say, I'm going to do this job. What should I charge? Because then I will be able to say to them, okay, we'll think about It's not this, it's this, you know, what do you want to make a year? Like work backwards from that. If you, if you know that you want to live on, if you can live on $50,000 a year, great. Work back from that. What does that mean? What does your car cost you? What does your transit cost you? What does your petrol cost you? Understand what you're going to pay out, out of that money that you're making in order to get to that money. Anyway, it, it really, and it makes me really sad when people come into this business, which is so fun and Mm -hmm. immediately disadvantage themselves by charging garbage rates. Sorry, garbage isn't a very nice word, but, you know, under underpaying themselves because they want to get clients. And this is the other thing. Generally, people will come in and take that low rate from you once and realtors are going to take that low rate from you once. And as soon as you raise your rates to market they're going to dump you because then you know what clients you're working with. I don't want to work with a client who's coming to me for a money point. I want somebody to come and work with me because they know they're going to get great work. They're going to get a beautiful set of images. Their clients are going to be happy. They're sellers and their reputation is going to be enhanced by working with me. And yeah, it's going to cost them more money on the upfront, but Hey, that's a business cost. So at the end of the year, when you're paying, you know, doing your taxes, You take all the invoices you got from me and give them to your accountant and say, hey, it cost me this much money to do business this year. Mm -hmm. It's important for people to think about money in that bigger sense other than I just want to make 20 bucks today, you know, or pay 20 bucks today. Sorry, there was a big rant. (laughs) No, I I agree. I see so many people who will even offer their services for free. It's like Mm -hmm. everyone, the, the people who are like, People will take things for free. It doesn't mean they're going to pay for you. Yeah. Like there's entirely, and then the feedback they give you is entirely different from the people who would pay you, you know, a thousand yes. or whatever you yes. actually need to live on. Yeah. It's just, it's really weird um, how often that comes up. I mean, like it, it's like prevalent in almost every field that I've seen yeah. where people, like if it says sciences, like people with PhDs think that like, oh, well, I'm not, I mean, not used to making money, so it's like twenty, thirty thousand a year. Like I've had, crazy. Yeah, yeah, I've helped with hiring before, and there's been a couple people that were like the best probably like some of the best in the world and they were like can i have like forty thousand? i was like no i'm not gonna pay you forty thousand. i'm gonna pay oh, you way so more than sad. that yeah. i'm gonna pay you way more than that just do a good job and like it'll be fine they're like are you sure you know i don't want to yeah. like bubble it's like yeah it's like don't worry you're worth it just like this is the first thing for you so don't you know don't worry about it yeah um but there's so many people like in startups and any business they'll be like oh i'll do this like free amount like when i first started doing consulting like many many years ago i would just be like i said i had a if I do a bad job, I'll give you your money back. I don't care. And uh-huh. no one's ever taken me up on it, but they were like, oh, okay, he'll give me my money back if he does a shit job. And they yeah. were like, th- then I got like my first 10 and then I stopped offering that. And then I, I was like market rate from day one, which is nice. Yeah. But that was and like many, I, many yeah, years I ago. Think, I think that's a really important thing that you just said. Uh, and, and in terms of working for free, I'm not opposed to working for free in certain mm. contexts. So 
we really close to where I live, we have um, the military museum. So there's the military museums in Calgary are partnered, partnered with the military museums in Ottawa, which is our, the capital of our country. And these museums are beautiful and they're beautiful. Oh my goodness. The first time I walked in there, there's like this big atrium and uh, it's amazing. And I, I mean, I'm a crier anyway, but I walked into this place and just burst into tears because it's so beautiful. Um, anyway, the short story is, I, I wanted to be hired for a job there, but they had this funding that I was outside of age-wise. So they said, well, would you like to volunteer here? And that was probably one of the most mm -hmm. amazing opportunities because they are a nonprofit and because the what they do at the museums is really important. There's a lot of support for veterans and, you know, it's just, uh, but by virtue of that, because it's the only other big museum in the country, military museum in the country, there are loads of people that come through there. So. Um, the Countess of Wessex, so she is um, Prince Edward's wife, she came to open the museums on behalf of the Queen. And I was the photographer, so I got to follow her around all day. Okay, so I'm not charging for this. And this was really at the front end of my career, but I had a day with the Countess of Wessex while she opened the museums. And that was part of my portfolio, obviously. And everything that else that I've done at the museums, I've been with, you know, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Veterans Affairs, uh, the Finance Minister, you know, all these dignitaries come through there. Provincial dignitaries come through there. I've worked with several of the provincial premiers through there. I've worked with the Governor General of the province. So, and, and I feel very, personally, I feel very committed to what they do in that organization. So I've been there since 2009 and I still do that work for nothing. That is my big all time, all year round. Anytime they ask me to come, I will come. The other thing that we do uh, once a year is this giant festival in Calgary called Global Fest, which is a cultural event. It's the last two weeks of August in the summer. And it's, it's two things. It's a big cultural event. There's lots of music and dancing and uh, song and food and you know, shopping areas and this thing is, you know, kiosks that are outside. It's around this beautiful lake and there's a fireworks competition. And we, we started shooting that, you know, cause we were there, we just started shooting and we sent some of the images that we'd made to the organization and they're like, Hey, <laughs> so we've been with them for 13 years as well. And it's, you know, like it's a, it's a 10 day festival runs over Run, runs over 10 days it's five days in there because it's outdoors so they hold a day over in between just in case of weather so you know we've been with them for a really long time and what that's done for us is because we have to organize a team every year it's allowed us my jason and i my husband that was in here as professional photographers who are paid for their work to bring on maybe another couple of pros and then we bring on four photographers who are brand new to it, you know, that are not completely green, but obviously have a little bit of experience. And it gives us an opportunity to mentor them, give them an access to this huge event with all these, you know, moving parts and to have some recognition. And then whenever we send the photos up to the organization, uh, we, we watermark them so that our team is also recognized. They, they come under our, you know, our team name or our company name, but so we've done this for 13 years and we know that we've, um, sorry, I don't want to sound really egotistical here, but there have been some people that we've worked with in the last 13 years who've really been able by virtue of being part of our team to get their feet under them as photographers. And so, yes, we're not being paid for that, but the benefit to us is, as volunteers is really, really huge. So to put this all together, for new photographers, I would say to them, get an organization who needs that needs them and commit to that organization, maybe just for a year and be present for that organization. And, and you know, you're getting a, a co um, co beneficial relationship there where you're learning, you know, bettering your photography and you're providing something really valuable to them because that's their archives. And, and, you know, I've been with the military museums, like I say, since 2009, and I wouldn't necessarily suggest that somebody take on an organization and stay there for the rest of their lives. But, uh, but you know, do that once a year, like pick an organization, tell them you're going to be with them for a year, that everything you do for them is, you know, they can use it for whatever purposes they want to use it for. Cut your teeth and then, you, you know, meanwhile, you're building your practice, you're learning how to work better, you're learning how to work with people in a better way. It's really useful. But when somebody hires you, 
because you now have experience, now you can say, well, I'm an experienced photographer. My rates are market rates. Mm -hmm. And you have the chops to say and the reason to do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm ranting. I'm all about no, it makes a lot of sense. Money. <laughs> no, um, I, it's, it's, it's sad to hear that people think you sell out when you do so much to give to other people. I think well, that, yeah. I don't know. So I, you know, one of, one of the people who said that to me, oh, you know, you're kind of a sellout. And it's funny because it's somebody I know really well and I've known for a really long time. And he's somebody I go to all the time because he happens to work at the best camera shop in this city. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I don't know what to say to you, buddy, because, you know, you're really important to me because I come and buy all my gear from you. But I'm not a sellout because I don't work part time in a camera store. <laughs> like I do what I do, right? I, mm -hmm. I don't mean to be dismissive that this, we have this store in Calgary. It's literally called the camera store and it is brilliant. Every professional in the city goes there. Like, and it's a really interesting place because it's a meeting place for, it's a meeting place for photographers. Like there's, you know, Joe Buddy buying their first camera right up to uh, a couple people, Mike Drew and Leah Hennel, who are top of the pops in Canada as photographers. Well, they both live in the city here and they come into the camera store all the time. So sorry, that's a big plug for the camera store. We love those guys. They're fabulous. Like just, you couldn't get better support from a camera store. It's it's not regular retail. It really is a community there. Anyways, there you go. I've plugged a store. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully they'll give you a referral link. You get 10% or something off the oh. next order. Oh, That'd well. be fun. Yeah. Um, what is it? So you spend some of your time giving, you do some of your time real, uh, real estate photography, and you also uh, have exhibits that go up all around the world. Yeah. How does a photographer go from taking photos of like someone next to a tree to now having something exhibited throughout the world? I imagine that one, it's expensive. And then, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, there, I'm sure there's like lots of stuff there that is hard to do. I mean, for us, it was like super weird how it all happened. Like I had mm. no plans whatsoever to be an exhibiting photographer. And frankly, I didn't think that I could be that person. So um, in 2012, I was working, working with, I was kicking around with a guy that I know from the city here. Um, and we, this is a whole weird story. So I know that his name is Chris. He used to be in my eldest daughter's class. They were high school buddies. So you can understand that this guy is way younger than me. And I didn't, after they graduated high school, I didn't see this guy, obviously, because why would I, right? He's not, he wasn't somebody I knew very well. I mean, I knew him to see who he was, but anyway, my daughter, Courtney came to me one day and she says, Oh, Chris is, Chris is having a photography show. And I'm like, Chris, the football player. And she goes, Oh yeah, he doesn't play football anymore. He's a photographer. And it, it was the most remarkable show. He had done this show where he got tattoo artists and uh, a bunch of models and, you know, a DJ and a couple of photographers and everybody was naked. Like everybody was naked. And the whole show was this just amazing. That part wasn't to the public, but when he was making mm -hmm. all the work for this show, everybody was naked. I was just like, wow, how crazy is that? Anyway, the, the images that he made from this show are just so beautiful. And so I talked to him and I'm like, oh my goodness, what happened? How did you get from, you know, high school to this amazing photographer that you are? And anyway, we just became really good friends. We started kicking around downtown, you know, just doing street photography because that's his genre. And uh, um, in 2012 in London, there's a really big uh, photo um, photo thing that goes on over there, like a exhibition, not an exhibition, but an exposure kind of thing. And I said, well, let's go to London. Let's go to this thing. Like, I want to go shoot over there, a family over there. And he goes, oh, yeah, I have a British passport. I'm like, what? How do you have a British passport? Anyways, his dad's British. So off we go. And it happened to be the Queen's Jubilee that year in 2012. So we spent, you know, a week over there kind of kicking around London, pouring rain the whole time, shot all this work. And then when we came home, we're like, well, now what are we going to do? So I called the organizer for a festival that we have here in Calgary called Exposure Fest and said, hey, you know, we're looking for walls. And he had had a call literally the day before from a new gallery that's in the bottom of a shoe store here in the city. And they were looking for work during exposure. So there you go. We ended up with this gorgeous little brick gallery and we put this work from London up. Crazy. But we thought, OK, well, that's the only year we're going to do. 
And then the next year, my daughter's boyfriend was graduating from a school in New York City. And we thought, oh, we'll go down for the his graduation and, you know, kick around, take some photos. And we went down to the camera store where Chris was working at that time and, you know, told him what we were doing. And a man who was there, a photographer was there with his beautiful landscape book open on the table. And he heard me say New York City. And he goes, oh, hey, hey, can you can, come here and talk to me for a second? Can you take a book to a friend of mine in New York City? And I'm like, sure, why not? I'll put it in my bag. As, what she, who are, what are they called and where do they live? And she goes, it's Mary Ellen Mark. I'll, I'll tell you who she is in a second. Mary Ellen, well, I will tell you right now, Mary Ellen Mark has passed away now, but she is one of the quintessential street photographers in the world. And I didn't know her name, but Chris did. And Chris turned around and looked at me and he, like I could see his heart pounding out of his shirt. So he got on the phone to his boss and he's like, I have to go to New York on Monday. So we all got on the plane and went down to New York and spent a week down there and shot. And then we're like, well, we may as well put this up too. So we did another version of what then became tripping the streets. Fantastic. Like it was just so weird and organic and not what we expected to happen at all. And, you know, mm -hmm. by the third year, we're like, well, we may as well continue this on for a while. So we did Mexico city, which was amazing. And then we were going to go to Tokyo, but we waited too long and the cost got up. So we ended up going to Paris instead, which didn't suck. And then the final year that we were traveling, we did finally go to Tokyo and, which is again, an amazing city. And so, and then the sixth year of this thing, we just did a re retrospective and picked out the images that we loved the most from, but it's like, it was just the most ridiculous thing because we just went to shoot stuff and asked a few questions if somebody had walls during this festival and there, there you are. Mm -hmm. I'm still like kind of gobsmacked that that happened at all, but, but it, you know, kind of gives me a little confidence now to kind of, Oh, what else can I do? And whenever the, tripping the streets ended, I was kind of looking around for another project. <laughs> this is a whole another really long story. I won't bore you with the whole thing, but we had a, a crappy neighbor next door. And because of that crappy neighbor, a new house ended up being built. And the guy, the crew that came to put the fence up in the backyard was a boiling hot day and they had an old dog with them. So I went out and said, do you guys need water? And one of the guys had an injury on his knee. And I said, oh, what did you do to your knee? And he said, oh, I, I ride Indian Relay and I fell off a horse and I'm a girl. They said horse. I'm like, what, what is Indian Relay and are there horses? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm riding tomorrow night. And he didn't know me. He's an ind Indigenous guy and he didn't know me, you know, so he's like not really that inclined to have, oh, and he was like 18 years old at the time. He didn't really was not inclined to have a big old conversation with this, this woman. So we went and we were like, okay, well, we'll go out to this small town and go see this Relay. And it, it's a huge indigenous crowd that goes to this thing. So it's a way different vibe than, you know, sort of white people sports in town. It's just like way more relaxed. It's way more community. It's just immensely fun. And we asked somebody standing outside the track at the gate, we said, can we go across into the infield so that we can shoot? And they're like, oh yeah, just watch for the horses. <laughs> so, okay. We have no idea what we're watching for, but anyway, walk across the track and see this first heat. And it's, immensely it's very dangerous and it's really fast and it's just amazing to watch these guys just basically do three rounds of the track and they're jumping on and off horses every mm. every circle of the track and anyway so we're shooting all this it's crazy to shoot and at the end of the last round I thought well we'll continue on around again so that the horse can cool down so I stepped out into the middle of the track not knowing that they actually get to the back side of the track and turn around and come back the way they went. Mm. So I'm like standing there with my back to these four thoroughbreds coming right at me. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, like some big arm came around me and dragged me off the track and my face is in somebody's chest. And I look up and this guy, Dexter, his name is, he's like, I got to keep you alive. <laughs> Anyway, so we started shooting this thing and Dexter, who had started the racing association here um, that day, asked us if we could shoot all the winning teams. And we did. And we sent the photos to him. And he's like, you know, we'd really like you to be around when we do these. And we're like, we would love to be around. So we shot this thing for a year and went, that was the, in 2018 was the first year that the Canadian teams were invited to come to the United States for this first international competition which was amazing so we drove down to Walla Walla Washington all through the Palouse and all that gorgeous shot that and then we thought well we, you know we should 
we should do something with these images to help promote this sport. So we went to Dexter and said, this is what we're thinking of doing. Are you okay with this? Are you on board? We're not indigenous because, so we're not, you know, just doing it without the blessing of the community. No way. Uh, and Dexter, whose last name is Bruised Head, he's the most amazing guy. And this other woman that we were working with as well, um, Levina Manyguns, they both were very, very supportive of us you know, presenting this in support of the, anyway, it's so weird. Like, you know, if, if I hadn't gone out to give this kid or this team of guys some water for their dog, this never would have happened. So what I say to people about exhibiting is um, be, be aware when an opportunity comes into your life and don't, sorry, it's a terrible thing to say don't because it's hard to, um, Mm -hmm kind of act on those things but if an opportunity comes to do something really cool be be um don't be afraid to bring it further than that you know those photos should never just stay in a computer somewhere there's always a little coffee shop or some small gallery or some place that will be interested in having work on their walls and if they're getting it for we don't charge for this exhibition that's a whole other thing you know uh, but there, we've exhibited that four times in Calgary and it's now just gone to Tokyo and it's gone to going to Washington next week. And we don't charge for it. We don't charge for this show because again, we don't want to make money off the backs of these teams and these families. Um, so our, our, our commitment to them is to promote the sport and to promote it internationally. And we also provide them, all those guys, we provide them uh, um, professional work so that they can use. So anyways, it's a whole long story, but I, like to, that that we exhibited at all was completely happenstance just out of the blue we never anticipated it happening and I don't have an art background per se so I have no training in how to set up a gallery show or how to you know promote that or find somebody to put it up it's just been people kind of saying yes to us when we asked and you know the worst thing that can happen is somebody says no right and then you just keep yeah. going on and you know, find somebody else that'll say yes. But anyway, it's been a whole thing. So yeah. I don't know what to say about it. Like, I, w- I guess if somebody were to call me and say, how do I do this? I could have a more specific conversation with them. But uh, yeah, no, ask me something else. <laughs> well, I think the sometimes people don't take opportunities just to like mm. pick one thing that we were just discussing. They don't take opportunities because they're not used to like uh, conquering their fears. And so yeah. I always recommend like, um, if you can find something every day, like if you're someone with anxiety, you know, definitely, you know, see a psychologist and whatnot, but, um, there, there's like tons of stuff where maybe just like send an email is like, yeah. that's, that's hard for you, but just do it once a day. Yeah. You know, if, if, yeah. so that the weird thing is if you do that enough times, if you do something that's like kind of uncomfortable, like you're at a coffee shop, you see a nice guy, you say, Hey, I'm going to go say hi to that person, you know, or there's mm-hmm. a nice lady, go say hi. And like, you know, you just say hello and be a friendly human and go on with your day. Mm-hmm. Like you build up the muscle. So when these opportunities come, like the like the courage muscle has been built up so you can take advantage yeah. of them yeah 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 so I, I think totally that's... agree i think that's really true Wait, i'm sorry to interrupt you i have t- no, two good. two friends um one is actually one's an acquaintance and one's become a really good friend this friend of mine angela is an amazing photographer she she is all about birds and she's all about little birds and i tell you what her work like uh, Her work is so stunning. It's so gorgeous and so ethereal. And I said to her, like, where are you exhibiting? And she's like, oh, I'll never do that. I'm not good enough. I just don't feel like Mm -hmm. I could do that. And, you know, exactly what you're saying. Like, she was not willing to go anywhere near that courage muscle. And I was just, Angela, you have to put this stuff up. Like, what is the worst thing that can happen? You package this all up. You go to actually the coffee shop that I met her in that day they had art all over their walls. I'm like, Ange, just call these guys. They're going to take this down at some point. What are they going to, you know? And they were thrilled two bits for her to approach them with this beautiful work. And she's like, wow, I can't believe that happened. So I agree with you. I think that courage muscle is a, a really, really important thing to pay attention to. And I think, you know, I don't know how much photography you do yourself, but one thing about photography that's really weird is it's kind of like running around naked in public because at some mm, so at wrong. some point, you know, it's like your soul that's out in these images. Yeah. So, you know, I do get it when people are hesitant because they don't, you know, none of us like to be, well, I'm old now. I don't care anymore, but you know, people don't love being judged and it, uh, you know, 
I, I get that, but I think, you know, photography is important because it's the person who's making that work. It's their interpretation of their world. And it's also, it allow it gives people who are viewing the work an opportunity to shift how they feel about the world or see something different about the world. Or, you know, you can imagine this work that's gone to Tokyo. First of all, Indigenous people are, are indig North American Indigenous people are completely unknown to the people in Japan for the most part. So just by virtue of this stuff going up on the walls, we've, you know, given these a whole different culture, an eye into what Indigenous people are in, in Canada. I, I don't know. I just think photography is really important and I get that whole mm -hmm. naked and public thing, but you are right that doing that one thing a day that just like even doing this, I'm not particularly uh, unhappy about public speaking, but at the same time, you know, a podcast is like, okay, well, what if I say something really stupid? And I'm like, oh, that's a fine. I'll just say something stupid and people can deal with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you haven't said anything bad. I would, I would uh, probably uh, just delete it if you said yeah. something terrible. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, what what is it? What are like the metrics for uh, an exhibit to be successful? Like, is it is it like is it just like a, an experience that you want people to have? So then yeah. do you like kind of curate that, or is it like a financial thing? Because but at the same time you don't uh, charge for everything. So it sounds yeah. like more it's it's like um it's like a like a like a CV of of something that you've done and yeah. capture like something that you want to want to do. So. I think like kind of from a business perspective, it's like, I guess a good way to get something out there, but also like to tune that uh, emotional artistic muscle of yourself. Yeah. But what are some of the, um, what are like the criterion for knowing like when you go in there and you walk away that this was, this was great. This is a success. Well, yeah, like I say, you know, like I don't have an art background. So, you mm -hmm. know, all that training that uh, artists get when they go to school, when they go to art school, I don't have any of that. So I'll tell you what I think are good metrics. So when Chris and I did Tripping the Streets, we left a book there, like, you know, just a lined, you know, a little lined, um, oh, what do you call that in English? I don't know what it's called in English, but anyways, a little hardcover book with lines in it. I call that a kayi. And you know, we just left it open on the table and let people write comments in there. And that for mm -hmm. us was a really interesting way to know what people thought, wh what shifts in their perception came, you know, like that. It was really interesting. We've kept all those pages and they're lovely to read for us now. Um, with Relay, uh, that that's also been really interesting because Relay, you know, it's open to the public. Anybody can go to a Relay, but people don't go to them because they're often, usually they're on a nation, like on the First Nation. So, you know, you kind of have to go to the First Nation, drive in there. And I'll tell you, in our, in my province anyway, people are not, what white, non-Indigenous people are not really inclined to go to the nations anyways. And I think they don't know that there's stuff going on up there. So, or on the nations, We're, we live in Treaty 7 land. So the nations are all around us. Our city is right in the middle of Treaty 7. And um, I just think people, it's weird how separate we are, even though we live on those people, we live on their land, right? We're smack in the middle. So I think one thing that with Relay is it's great for, I, I hope it's been great for the teams and people to have access to, you know, our photography. But I think for the non-Indigenous community, it's been even more important, I hope, because the way we put this exhibit up, the images are uh, 11 and a half by 14. So a lot of them are verticals and some of them are horizontals, but they're they're at 58 inch centers. So the center of the image is at 58 inches and they're small. The image itself is eight and a half by 11. And why we did this is so that people couldn't stand all the way across the room and look at things. They would have to walk mm. up to this image and have an experience with it. And, and a lot of them are portraits. So, you know, if you're not an indigenous person and you're not a person who goes to the community for all the rodeos and everything that's going on, you would not have that experience of yeah. walking up and staring at somebody in the face. Like, you know, some of these images are, can you, Oh, I guess you can't see it. I'll, I'll open that door in a second. But so, so for us, the success of that exhibition is indigenous people saying, thank you. It's important mm -hmm. that our, this crazy sport gets out to the public, but for non-indigenous people to go, holy crap, those people are so athletic and they're so strong and oh, wow, that's dangerous. And wow, that's so colorful. And I didn't know about that. And I would love to see a relay that to me is the, that's the success for me is, is, you know, getting people to a point where they're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to flex that courage muscle and go to the nation to the rodeo or go to the nation for a relay. And I'm going to meet these people where they're at and understand this culture and have some great food, 
I don't know if you ever get a chance to go to uh, any Indian relay. I know there's some in this, a lot of them in the States. There'll be this, somebody turn up with a food truck that has Bannock burgers. They're great. Hmm. So anyway, is it just normal beef? What's a Bannock burger? Oh, Bannock, Bannock is actually the bread. It's actually, weirdly enough, it's very common in the, in Scotland, but yeah, it's this really delicious, puffy, gorgeous fried bread with, yeah a beef burger in it. And Hmm. sometimes they put fried onion rings in it. And it's just like, it's so good. It's so delectable, but it's very fattening, but who cares? Hmm. Uh, But like for us, like I say, the success of that exhibition has just been to let not most, mostly for non-Indigenous people to see that this exists at all and to get them to go and take advantage, take, enjoy it. Um, You know, we live Mm -hmm. in Canada anyways, there's, um, this whole, you know, tr- truth is truth and reconciliation with our indigenous communities cross country is really front and center right now. And sometimes it's hard to find a way to give, like literally to allow people to meet and so that they can understand each other and relay and rodeo and um, first nations rodeo are really good ways because that is something that anybody will go to, you know, like a relay is cool. A rodeo is cool. It's not so strange to non-Indigenous people that they might not go. And then usually attached to relay and rodeo, there's a powwow. So, you know, lots of non-Indigenous people will have never been to a powwow. They've never been inside a roundhouse. I hadn't before we did relay. We, we'd gone to Indigenous rodeo a lot, but we've never been to a powwow. And I think a lot of people think they can't do that. So mm-hmm. By virtue of this exhibition, if we can get people to go to relay rodeo and the powwows there and the roundhouse is there and the dance competitions are there and people will say to you, come in the door, come in the door, come in the door. The food's over there. Sellers are over there. Come in, come in, come in. This is a big deal for people. That for me, that that matters. And more so because we've become really good friends with some of these families. Uh, it, it just really Sorry, I'm going to get all teary now. Thanks, I'm crying. <laughs> no, um, I, it it is really important. People don't really um, the Native Americans have, I think that's the term we use in the United States, but they um, they they don't get a lot of uh, representation. Like when I was in college, yeah, there would be a Native American course, but um, it wouldn't meet quota, so they would cancel it every semester. Oh. So we want to learn about this, like you know. But yeah. even even in college, like you couldn't get people, you couldn't get enough people in one area. Um, to sit down and, and listen to these things. Yeah. And they're, um, man, they have, they have a lot of problems nowadays where like people are like targeting them more than others for human trafficking and stuff. And, yeah. uh, it's really horrible. So I, I think it's really beautiful that you're, you're drawing a light to these people so that I think one of the reasons that people probably target them is like no one pays attention. So you're like helping people pay attention and see like these people yeah. are my, you know, just like me, they just yeah. have different yeah. culture and stuff. So yeah. that's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're fortunate in the city that we live, you know, where we are. Um, Treaty 7 is a very, very big piece of a big area of, of the province. It, you know, it's there's Treaty 6 and Treaty 7, and then there's Métis Nation 3, which um, basically is all the land here. You know, it's all uh, Indigenous land that we happen to live on. And, uh, and you know, I it's funny, when I was doing research for, you know, the information that we wanted to put up with Indian Relay, I didn't know that my city was on Indigenous land. I didn't realize that we were in the middle of Treaty 7. I didn't know that. I thought, well, the nations are all around us and Calgary is its own thing. And I was so shocked to find out. And how my question, I guess, is kind of like, well, how did I get to be at that time a 58-year-old woman who's lived here my whole life? And I did not know that my city is on Indigenous land, not surrounded by. Like, I was so embarrassed. Anyway, so this really, the kid, the, he's not a kid anymore, but the young man who kind of got it all started, um, we've become really good friends with his family. And I was out at a relay with them one year, and I, his dad got me up on the back of his horse. And his dad's name is Irv. And I'm like, Irv, I got to tell you something, you know, I'm like really embarrassed, but I just sort of just understood this. Like I didn't know. And then I started to cry. And this guy, he's, he's so lovely. He's just a very quiet, very, you know, like I wouldn't, I don't want to say typical indigenous man, but you couldn't, you wouldn't confuse him for, you know, not an indigenous man. Anyways, I'm up on the back of the horse sobbing into his back and he goes, you got to get off. 
<laughs> and he dumps me off by the fence. <laughs> he, you know, like I know he heard me, but oh, anyway, that was a weird moment. But he's lovely yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. Maybe it was like the outfit. I couldn't handle the water. He just didn't want me to be crying on his back. I don't know, but like, and I know he heard me. Like, I know he heard me say, yeah. "I'm so embarrassed. I didn't know this." Um, but I will say that he, he is such a generous person that he heard me and that was all that was going to happen. He wasn't going to embarrass me. He, mm -hmm. well, he told me to get off his horse, but whatever, <laughs> but yeah, you know, in terms of me not knowing that he wasn't about to embarrass me and say, why the hell didn't you know, you know, like mm -hmm. he wasn't about to do that. He heard me, he accepted it. That was it. It was, you know, on to the next thing. So they're fabulous. Yeah. I get it. I don't know if I could just back off here for a second. I'm going to open my door so you can see this image. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to make a little noise. Sorry, sorry, sorry for everybody listening. <laughs> no worries. Oh, that's good. That's a cool picture. Noise. So if you can see over my shoulder there, that mm -hmm. is um, Stephen Wolftail on the thing back there. So he's, he's the kid. He was a kid at that time, but he's who came in our backyard and said, Oh, I'm, you know, I ride relay. And it's funny because that photo there, he didn't tell me anything about what they were doing. So I didn't know that they were dressed. I didn't know they were in costume. I didn't know they had war paint on and I didn't recognize him. I was looking all over this rodeo grounds for this kid. No idea what he looks like. And I saw him run his race He's, he's the jockey. They call it the brave. And he jumps off the horse and he recognizes me because, you know, I stick out like a sore thumb <laughs> and he comes running across the track and hugged me and, oh, thank you for coming. And anyways, and I just, he stood there for a second and I said, Steve, just look off, just look off to the side of it. And that is the image I shot. I don't know if you can see mm. it very well, but I can see it. Yeah. So that was, you know, that image and that kid, like life changed he changed our lives and i know he's really sick of me saying it but every time i see him i say stephen you know your presence in the world and in my life has been literally life changing life changing and i think that's a, something that you know photographers if even if they think they're messing around and they're just you know a hobbyist and blah 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 there will be a moment where you'll have a moment and you can make that moment into you know you can let it just go by you or go, Oh, wow, this is a mm. wait. I need to dig into this. And yeah, we've, we've just had so many experiences like that. Like t Tokyo was a little different when we were shooting over there because we don't speak the language first of all. And, and um, Japanese people tend to be much, much, much more polite than, you know, sort of, and we're polite in our city. Like we get called on it all the time up here, how polite Canadians are. But uh, so in Japan, I don't know if I really had as much of the opportunity for that moment because people, they will never stare at you either. They won't come up to you mm. and just like stare at you in the face. They'll kind of side eye you. Maybe if you're, a, you know, me, <laughs> like I say this hair, people are like, what is that? Um, Mexico City was brilliant. When we went down there, people were very, very likely to talk to us and just generous and fun and oh i loved mexico city amazing some guy stopped me in the middle of the road one day like a big busy road he stopped me and he was asking me about my hair <laughs> and we're standing in these cars are going by and i'm like no cierto, no cierto. <laughs> it was really funny um mm -hmm. what are um what are some of the projects you're gonna be working on moving forward like what's 2023 held for you well, so this year, um, we're kind of somewhat focused on the thing with the project that's in Washington. We're hoping that that's mm -hmm. going to travel a little bit um, in the States. Uh, the, what, the embassy, it's going to the Canadian embassy in D.C., and they were so generous. They agreed to reprint the entire show, reprint and reframe, which saved us from having to bring back the work from Tokyo. So we're kind of hoping that the Canadian embassy is going to help us find places in the States, you know, in this Eastern seaboard and stuff to travel that around a little bit. So I'm kind of hoping to hear back from, I've emailed a few people at Columbia University. They have an Indigenous um, education, for, not for Indigenous people, but about Indigenous people. So we're kind of mm -hmm. hoping that we can connect with them some how the show that the work that's still in Tokyo is we hope going to two other locations there one is 
the Tokyo Racing Association, which is, you know, regular horse racing, um, they want to put it up in their space. And then up north in Hokkaido, so there are two islands on the side of Japan. Um, and the northern island there, the top, the city that's at the top is called Hokkaido. And Hokkaido has a museum of northern, what's it called? The Hokkaido Museum of Northern Peoples. And they're quite interested in having the show come there. So we're, you know, it's, it's all kind of hope, hopeful at this point. It's, it's reasonably sure, but until we get a yes, it's not a yes, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm working with um, my a really, really good friend, my really lovely friend, Tanya, who was the gallery manager of our the gallery that Chris and I had our first show up. She and I have become really close friends and she's a poet and she's a talented poet. And she we were out for coffee last year, I guess. And she was just reading me these little short stanzas of some po poems that she'd written. And of course, like I say, I'm a crier. And she, she read, did this one poem about what I understood to be a soldier in the last years of his life. And I'm crying my eyes out. So I'm like, we're going to do a show. So we're going to put together a show called Poet Witness, where mm -hmm. um, we're going to do 20 of 20 images and 20 poems. I'm going to pick 10 of her poems and, and illustrate them with my photography. And she's going to take 10 of my images and illustrate some of her work. And we're not going to know what the other has done until it goes up on the walls. So we're going to have to That's hang on two different days. Yeah. And then the opening night, we'll both see what we've done with each other's to interpret each other's work. So, um, so that yeah. was, was going to go up this year, but the, the place we're going to put it is um, booked for the month that we want it in. So we're going to go to 2024 with that one and have it up during poetry month, which is April in Canada. Hmm. So and is there in your website, the, like the link tree that you sent me, that'd be the best place to stay up to date with these new things coming out or is there yeah, like a, one um, spot? Well, I do kind of put it up there. Like if I'm going to sort of say anything about it, I'll often, it's in that link tree um, on my Facebook. I have Julie Vincent mm. photography on Facebook. So, you know, kind of when this stuff happens, but I will tell you, I suck at promoting myself. <laughs> I, I am, I don't, it's a, it's a really weird thing. And I think people away from Canada will often say this about Canadians. We are not very good at bragging about ourselves. And so I know I've suffered from that too. You know, it's a cultural thing, but uh, I, 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 I will put it up there when I have confirmed news, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm like not harping on it every single day. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, if people can follow me and they'll, you know, if they're, especially people in DC, I would especially love it. If anybody who's in the DC area is listening to this podcast, um, that show's going up. I think they're going to hang it tomorrow or the next day. So it'll be up and it's up till March, the end of March. So there's lots of time mm -hmm. for people to go. Uh, uh, I'm going to make an invitation actually. Do you know, do you know who Rabia Chowdhury is? Um, the name doesn't ring a bell. Okay. So, you know, that whole Adnan Syed case, Rabia, she, she's Rabia's brother was friends with Adnan and she's was one of the reasons that Adnan has finally been um, exonerated of this crime that he didn't commit. And she lives in Baltimore and Baltimore is only half an hour away from uh, DC. So, and I kind of talk to her every so often on Twitter. So I'm going to send Rabia an invitation and ask her to come to the one week because the embassy is bringing us down to do a mm -hmm. talk one night. So I'm going to invite her. It's so out on the limb, but worst thing she can say is no. So yeah, you'd be surprised yeah. how often people say yes. Uh -huh. They definitely, um, yeah. even though you're not good at uh, self promoting, uh, it seems to have worked out for you. Yeah. So <laughs> keep doing what works, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are, are there um, books that you'd recommend people check out? Oh gosh, there's so many books. Um, I, uh, in terms of learning, sorry, and I don't want to make necessarily promote a particular person, but there is a series of books that um, Scott Kelby put together. Scott Kelby is a photographer, of, you know, 40, 50 years as well. And there's one book in that series in particular called, um, how, how do I do, uh, maybe it's called Photoshop recipes. I'm so sorry. I don't have it in my hand. Anyway, it's, it's the most excellent book in the way it's laid out in that when you open it up, there's a photograph and this was on one side of the page, it says, this was my concept. And on the other side of the page is this is how I achieved it. And it's like facing mm. pages to say how to get from A to B. So that's in a series of six books. One of them's Photoshop recipes. And uh, one of them's how do I do that in Photoshop? And they're, they're quite old. I think they're probably 15 years old. So they're great books. I really love those ones uh, to read. I'm, I'll look at anything by Annie Leibovitz and by extension, anything by uh, Mary Ellen Mark, just because I really love their style. 
um, Mary Landmark in particular, she did the kind of street photography that I particularly like, where um, it has to do with culture and letting people understand other cultures. Uh, I really like everything by Lisa Jewell, but that's got nothing to do mm. with photography. That's just good novels. <laughs> um, oh, there's, you know, it's funny. I have a tough time. Like the camera store here in Calgary has a very good library section or book sale mm-hmm. section. And it, well, it's very good, but it's not big. It's about the size of my office. And I can spend five hours in there. No problem. Mm. So I yeah. guess I would say it's important to pick up a book. Um, yeah. on, especially in photography, like pick something up and just go through it because I find that I will always see something I like or learn something I want to know or f- see an image that I might want to try and emulate. And that's valuable. Uh, so pick up a book, like go find a book, and just flip through it. You know, sometimes I go to the bookstore chapters or wherever and I pick up a book off the shelf and I'll sit on the floor and just go through it. Cause I don't necessarily need to, sorry, I shouldn't say this, but I don't necessarily need to own it, but I do want to kind of go through it and see what I can yeah. pick out. And, um, yeah, I've done that. Yeah. Just sit there and read some yeah. before purchasing it yeah. or even without purchasing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some really good photography magazines that I think are probably, mm. you know, really accessible for people who don't necessarily want to read a book, but you know, there's in Canada, there's a really great publication called uh, photo ed, which is published, I think four times a year. And it's just fun because it really highlights photographers. It's not, there's advertising of course, but it's, it's goal is to, um, promote Canadian photographers and a lot of times women photographers, which is nice because we tend to be sometimes a little bit under the radar. Um, you know, so photography magazines, I think are, are really accessible uh, just because you can learn things really quickly and they don't take yeah. up a lot of space, you know, like I have them all sitting in my thing over there. You also get, I imagine some of them at the library. I'm a big yeah. fan of the American library system and yeah. they have tons of stuff. And if they don't have it, they can, that you can recommend, it. you can, ref- yeah, uh, yeah, ask for it and they'll get it for you. Yeah. Um, Actually, I think you, so- I think in the U S you have this as well, but if we, in our city anyways, I have a library card for our local library and it, I can get all sorts of stuff as eBooks. Yeah. So again, yeah, you know, awesome. just go online and yeah. But that kind yeah. of thing. It's called the Libby app down here or, uh, Oh yeah. Libby. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's the same as yeah. us too. So, and I, I mean, re- there's all sorts of stuff like you, like podcasts, like YouTubes, like Julianne Cost, who's with Adobe. She's an absolutely amazing trainer. She's such a nice person. I've met her. I'm such a fan. Oh, I was such a fan girl. And I told her that when I met her, I was like, I'm going to blabber all over the place here because I'm such a fan. But like she does these really great, you know, four to five or six minute long training videos for everything you might want to know for Lightroom and Photoshop. So she's fun. Um, but yeah, I, I just think people need to, um, bless themselves with the time to learn the craft, you know, like give yeah. yourself a half an hour or an hour a day just to learn something new. Mm-hmm. So um, last question is, I know we, we touched on a lot of really cool things today. Um, is there anything we missed that you wanted to touch on? I just like, you never, from my point of view, I never know what I don't know. So I always, I always leave with that yeah. one because you never, you never know if I was like, Oh, I wanted to talk about this thing. No, actually, no, I think it's been a pretty interesting conversation. I just guess I would say to anybody who enjoys photography and has a camera, but is the wall that they have in front of them is I'm not a photographer Mm. for at one point. And I think people need, need to um, honor their, their passions, even if it's a tiny little passion give it, give it life and let it breathe. Because, you know, if if me, if I hadn't kind of like, I I wanted to do this and it was a passion and it was a hobby and I never thought I would make money at it, but I guess just, you know, don't say no, because you're just a hobbyist say at at the moment, I'm, you know, this is a hobby I love, but what do I want to do with it? Like, what can I imagine doing with it? Well, can I imagine doing family photography? Can I imagine, you know, being a second for somebody else who shoots weddings or events or whatever, you know, what can I get involved with? Like, is there an organization who I know or that I know that um, does something that I think is cool? Well, can I call them up and say, you know, I'm a hobbyist photographer, but I have some time. Would you like, would you like a photographer to contribute to you? You know, I just think, let it breathe. Like, that word, I'm just a hobbyist, take the, take the just out of there. And I'm a hobbyist right now. And who yeah. knows what's going to happen. Thank you for joining us today with the Learn With Lowell show. 
check us out at learnwithall.com. Anywhere podcasts can be found. Subscribe. Tell me what you thought of this episode. Check us out on YouTube in particular. It's a new thing I'm doing. Uh, Timestamps and links are in the show notes. Thank you for coming. And I hope everyone, every one of you found something today that you're curious about to learn more about. And you'll go out and be curious and learn something new. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.